being a participant in that as well. And uh, I'm excited to be in the house of the Lord. I trust you are as well. But uh, it is a blessing to be anywhere, to be alive physically, but more importantly, to be alive spiritually. And let me just ask this, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because some of the information is still yet unfolding, but how many of you are aware that there was a terror attack in New York this afternoon? About 3.05, if I understand correctly, is when the attack occurred, and Pastor and I had gone out for a late uh, lunch because of my radio program from 12 to 1 every day, and we went over to Golden Corral. And let me just echo what Pastor said and what has been said already this week. You ought to go to Golden Corral. How many of you have been there since it's been open? All right, I know there are long lines, but I, I was amazed. The parking lot was full when we got there today, but boy, do they get the people through quickly. The food was outstanding. The service was even better. So I want to encourage you to go. But when we got back from a wonderful meal, great time of fellowship at Golden Corral, I walked into the hotel room. I'd left the television set on, which I probably should not have done, but I did. It was on Fox News Channel. And the minute I turned my attention toward the television screen, they were talking about a terror attack in New York City. So I sat down and tried to catch up with what was going on. And it was obvious to me, to me it was very obvious, and really probably to most of you it was very, very obvious that this was a terror attack. When someone takes a vehicle and drives it down a bicycle path which has been set aside for only the purpose of people either walking on that section of roadway or people riding a bike on that section of roadway and for about nine blocks this gentleman drives his car and I use the word gentleman lightly but anyway he drives a vehicle nine blocks and just runs over people. Obviously that is a terrorist attack and I give kudos to Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo of New York because very quickly, within two hours after the attack occurred, they did a press conference and they said, you know, some of the information may change and indeed it might, but they called it a terror attack immediately. Now there is a pivotal word, an operative word they left out that they should have included in the word uh, terror attack. It should have preceded the word terror and that is this, they should have said this was an Islamic terror attack because the gentleman was shouting Allahu Akbar as he ran away from the vehicle that he was driving when it hit a bus. And I want you to think about this. He's driving nine blocks. There's an intersection of another roadway. Bus is coming by. He's cruising along at about 40, 45 miles an hour from what I've heard. Hits the bus. A couple of people, adults injured on the bus. A couple of children, none of them seriously. But uh, when he gets out and starts walking, running through the streets, he's shouting Allahu Akbar. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to put all the elements together and understand, plus the fact that this echoes what has been taking place in other nations around the world in London, England. On two occasions they've had these people driving cars uh, that were motivated by Islamic ideology, mowing people down. And then of course in Nice, France, one other place in the country of France as well, the same thing occurred. And about a year ago, about a year ago, there is a major Islamic magazine, terrorist magazine, that called on those that were adherents to jihadism or to rabid Islamic terrorism, calling on them to do exactly what we are now watching people do, and that is turn your vehicle into a weapon and use it to kill people. And so uh, to me it was very obvious early on that's what this was, but at least, at least the leaders acknowledged it was terror. They didn't say it was Islamic terror. But folks, here's the deal. Can I just say it this way? We've got to admit the truth or we're not going to able, be able to ever stop what's going on. We just have to admit the truth. My brother has said it very well. He said, Dave, we will never be able to defeat what we are unwilling to accurately define. Well, I want to say that again. We'll never be able to defeat what we're unwilling to accurately define. We can call it everything but what it is, and if we keep on doing that, we'll never ultimately stand any chance whatsoever of stopping, defeating what's going on. And so uh, tomorrow on our radio program, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what happened, give the latest information, and then we're going to talk about uh, what we call things and how we go about actually dealing in a very practical way with this thing called Islamic terrorism because almost exclusively every act of terrorism that has been perpetrated in uh, our country since 9-11 has been perpetrated at the hands of people committed to Islamic ideology. Now please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Uh, I don't hate anybody that's a Muslim. I don't. I have some friends who are Muslim. Now they're not rabidly committed to the ideology. They've grown up in that background, have some friends in the nation of Israel. In fact, our bus driver for our tours in, in Israel when we go, his name is uh, Adel and he is a Muslim. He's Muslim by birth. He grew up in that, but he doesn't practice it. Here's the irony of it. He has a son that he named at birth, named his son when he was born Mohammed. 
but Mohammed is in a Christian school in the city of Jerusalem. Can I hear an amen right there? His textbooks are Christian school textbooks provided by Bob Jones University Press. And when I was in their home, Mohammed, who at the time was about 11 years old, came running out showing me his book for science and his book for history. And when I saw Bob Jones University Press, I about did a cartwheel. I was excited. So here is a young man from a Muslim family, not rabidly committed, they're not practicing Muslims, but he's in a Christian school because his daddy wants the best possible education that he can get for his son. And so he knows that Christian school is providing that for his son. And so he's getting the Word of God and everything taught from a biblical perspective every single day. I have lots of friends across the, the United States in various spots around the world that are just like that. So I don't hate anybody that's a Muslim. I want to see them come to know Christ as Savior and ought to hear an amen right there. We ought to love folks uh, to the Savior. But here's the deal. What's driving much of what's happening globally is an ideology a theology which Islam has and it is theology and ideology and the ideology and theology of Islam is this we conquer the world by eliminating the infidel, the kuffar we are called. Those that will not commit to the Islamic ideology, if they will not submit, and that is what the word Islam means is submission. If we will not submit, then we are to be annihilated at the edge of the sword or any other means possible right now. The operative tool are vehicles, automobiles. And so friends, we've got to be honest in the United States of America and stop the politically correct, correct speak and we've got to address these things honestly. And so uh, we need to pray for our national leaders. And on Sunday evening, I gave you a, a challenge. And even in the prayer room tonight, we had 12 people in the prayer room. That was absolutely awesome. Great time of prayer. And uh, I heard people praying for some, in fact, all of those three things uh, about uh, which I ask you to pray. And so we need to continue to pray for our national leaders. And this is a teachable moment as we minister with great concern for those that are family members of those that lost their lives. While all of that is taking place, it is still a teachable moment for us to address these issues in a way that's going to be substantive and beneficial so that we might stop the future. And by the way, I just got a text before the service started from a friend of mine and he said, Dave, he said, think of it like this. Those that are unwilling to call an enemy what the enemy actually is are really no greater than someone who will not admit the truth about cyanide or some other substance that someone could ingest into their body accidentally. And you know, if someone knew something was going to kill someone and they wouldn't say the truth about it, we would hold that person responsible for not speaking the truth, would we not? We would. So when it comes to this, uh, this ideology that has so permeated our culture and it's been lied to or we've been lied to about it. Oh, it's a religion of peace. It's just been hijacked by a few radicals. No, it is not a religion of peace and it has not been hijacked by a few radicals. The entire 1400 years of Islamic history proves that they have always conquered at the edge of a sword. And by the way, America's first run-in with Islam did not start on 9-11-2001. If you know anything about the Barbary Wars or the Barbary Pirates during the days of Thomas Jefferson's presidency, we had been paying tribute to the Barbary Pirates so that our ships could pass through a section of water there. And Thomas Jefferson said, we're not going to do that anymore. And so he spoke the truth. And so America's war with Islam actually started with the Barbary Pirates all the way back in the 1700s. So this is not a new battle for us. It's just taken a different flavor and a greatly escalated urgency on the part of the Islamic world. But this really is not new to us. And part of the ignorance of our history, and I know I'm getting on my soapbox, pardon me for doing it, but part of the ignorance of our history and the penalty that comes with not knowing our history is when we don't know the past, we don't remember the mistakes of the past. And we're not ready really to move forward in the future. And the old statement, those that don't know their history are doomed to repeat the negative aspects of their history, that's true. And so we've got to know our history and we've got to know the truth and we've got to be willing to graciously, lovingly speak truth. And so you pray for us. We're going to speak truth lovingly and winsomely but directly on the radio tomorrow. And I would encourage you to listen in. Any of you been able to listen in this week? Anybody been able to do that? I know a pastor got to listen to a little bit of yesterday's program which was a really a unique program. Today's was equally unique. Tomorrow will be the same we're going to have Dr. Jimmy DeYoung on. He is the host of his own nationwide radio program called Prophecy Today. Every other Wednesday he's on with us. 
And tomorrow he'll be our guest. But we're going to talk to him about what happened in New York and how that plays into a global scenario that is at work. And he is an expert on that. And so if you can listen in, I'd implore you to do so. Acts 19, if you would, please. Appreciate you putting up with that little speech there and uh, smiling at me so graciously like you are. But Acts chapter number 19, if you would, please. By way of introduction, let me share something with you if I can. I grew up in a pastor's home. I've told you that a number of times. My dad pastored close to 40 years in uh, a number of locations, uh, basically four locations around the United States of America. But for a while, he pastored in the mountains of North Carolina in a little mountain community called Burnsville, North Carolina. We lived, literally, our family lived, preacher, in a four-bedroom, or excuse me, not bedroom, four-room house, if you didn't count the bathroom, that made the fifth room. We had a kitchen, we had a living room, we had two bedrooms. It was a cracker box house, tiny as it could possibly be. I can't even imagine now going back and trying to live in that, but that's what we lived in. And across from that house where we lived in Burnsville, on the sloping side of a uh, North Carolina hill, there was a Country North Carolina Cemetery. Now, I never did figure out how they could dig graves on the sloping side of a hill. They probably do that in some parts of West Virginia, but they did that in Burnsville, North Carolina, and the cemetery was quite old. In fact, there were grave markers in the cemetery that dated all the way back to before for the Civil War. So anytime we had a guest in our home or a guest that came to speak at our church, my dad would always take them, if it was warm enough weather to do so, over into that country mountain, North Carolina Cemetery, walk them through the grave markers and let them note the dates on the grave markers and the age of the gravestones and all that. Just a fascinating trek through history. However, every time we would do that, my dad would always point out two grave markers among all those in that cemetery that were by far and away the most unique. And you could tell by looking at both grave markers at the same time that the ladies buried beneath each of them had both been wives of the same man. Now, I don't mean the man was a bit bigamist and he was married to two people at the same time. I mean, he was married to this lady. She passed away. He outlived her. He remarried. He outlived his second wife, buried his second wife right beside his first wife. Very, very interesting thing. Both grave markers were identical in shape. Everything that was on them was pretty much the same except the names and the date of birth, date of death, and one other distinction between the two grave markers. On the grave marker of his first wife, uh, above her name, date of her birth, date of her death, the, the, the man had had someone etch into the grave marker a very delicate woman's hand. Around the wrist portion of the woman's hand was a chain. It was attached to a shackle. The index finger of the carving of the woman's hand on the grave marker was extended, but he had the guy carve it where the finger was turned this way and pointing, Brother Scott, down. Now, ladies, may I say this? You may want to be careful how you treat your husband because if he outlives you, he does get the final say-so, if you know what I'm saying. Men, same thing's true for our wives. Now, I don't know what to take from that grave marker, and I looked at it many times as a boy growing up. I don't know what to take from that except this. In that man's estimation, that's where his wife went. Now, I don't know anything about the lady. don't know if she ever trusted Christ as Savior. don't know anything. But in his estimation... He was leaving a message for all that outlived both he and his wife. In his estimation, that's where she went. Beside that grave marker was the grave marker of his second wife. On it was her name, date of birth, date of death. And he also had whoever carved the information in the tombstone had them etch a delicate woman's hand. Preacher, it was, this one was different though. Extending diagonally down between the thumb and index finger of that hand on this second tombstone was a long stem rose. These three fingers were carved over clutching the rose. The index finger of that hand was extended, but it was pointing up. Now all I can assume from that is he thought his second wife went to heaven. Are you with me? Now, I don't know anything about her. don't know anything about the lifestyle choices she made. don't know if she ever trusted Christ as Savior. But in his estimation, first wife went to hell, second wife went to heaven. You say, preacher, why are you telling us that? Do you know a grave marker is the last reminder to everybody that outlives the person buried there? A grave marker is the last reminder in many ways as to what our life counted for. Someone told me years ago, Preacher, live your life in such a way so that when you die, you don't just leave a grave marker. Instead, you leave a legacy. That's good advice. Can I hear an amen right there? If there's anybody in the Bible who left by the lifestyle he lived, 
not a monument. Instead, he left a legacy. It's the man whose life I want us just to briefly look at tonight from the pages of the book of Acts, chapter number 19. Now, I'd love to go through the entire book of Acts, show you the sum total of this man's life. Obviously, I don't have time to do that. Wouldn't want to do that tonight. But the Holy Spirit has done an amazing thing. I mean, it's a phenomenal thing. Encapsulated into one chapter is the phenomenal influence of this man's life that we're about to talk about. And what we're going to do tonight is look at his life We're going to look at a couple of things about it, where he was known for what he was known. And then I want us to put his life up next to our life. And I want us to ask a very probing question tonight. Simply stated this, where am I known and for what am I known? You say, preacher, I'm not following you. Well, it'll be clear here in just a second. Look at Acts 19, if you would, please, verse number 1. Inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, Luke writes these words. He says, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, and there's our man, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. Now I want to have you look up at me for just a minute. Ephesus was at this time, at Paul's entry into the city of Ephesus, at this time Ephesus was a thriving ancient metropolitan city. Ephesus would have been to the ancient world every bit of what Charleston, West Virginia would be to the modern world. Every bit of what Charlotte, North Carolina would be to the modern world. It was a thriving metropolitan city. Not only did thousands of people live there, but thousands of visitors, typically on a weekly if not daily basis, would traverse through the streets of the ancient city of Ephesus. So it is a thriving place. Paul arrives there. Drop down to verse number 8. I want you to notice what he does when he arrives in Ephesus. Verse 8 says, and he, Paul, went in to the synagogue, which by the way, the synagogue was kind of their version of the church, a church building, so to speak. It was a place where the Word of God was read and explained and taught. He went into the synagogue, watch this, and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers, verse 9 says, the word divers means all sorts of, when all sorts of people Notice the rest of the verse, were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. And by the way, anytime in the book of Acts you see the words the way or that way, it is always referring to the way of Christianity. Now stay with me. Paul arrives in Ephesus, goes to the synagogue, stands up. Over a three-month period of time, he's teaching the Word of God. Not everybody was happy with what he had to say. Divers, all sorts of people in the synagogue were hardened. That is, they they resisted what Paul had to say. Again, look if you would please at verse number 9. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way, the way of Christianity before the multitude, he, Paul, departed from them, that is, he left the synagogue, and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Now look up at me for just a minute. Let me explain to you what's going on. Paul did not do what probably I would do. If I went into Ephesus and went into the church and people didn't want to hear me, if that happened here in Beckley, West Virginia, everybody said, preacher, we don't want to hear you anymore. I would probably not do what Paul did. I would probably leave town. But what Paul does is this. He finds himself an alternative place to preach. And the place he finds, according to the scriptures, is a school run by a gentleman named Tyrannus. Now just for your information, the word Tyrannus, the name Tyrannus means tyrant. That's literally what it means. Now can you imagine a school operated and the headmaster's name means tyrant? Can you imagine anybody wanting to attend that school? Well, it wasn't a school like today with desks and pencils and erasers and chalkboard and chalk. It wasn't that kind of school. It was a lecture hall. And by the way, my son has been in Ephesus. I have never been there. He has. He said, Dad, it is a tiny little building. The school of Tyrannus, part of it still stands to this day. It is about the size, no kidding, of this section right here. Just this section of seats, front to back, from here to here. It is about the size of this section of seats. It is a tiny room in a large metropolitan city. That's where Paul goes to preach the Word of God. Now I want you to notice what happens and how God uses Paul in a tiny little room. See, I hear this all the time. Our church is small. What can God do? I'm one person. Nobody's ever heard of me. How can God use me? Can I tell you this? God specializes in using the insignificant and turning it into the greatly significant. Can I hear an amen? Now I want you to watch your Bible. Verse number 10. 
And this continued, that is this preaching ministry Paul had in the school of Tyrannus, this continued by the space of two years. So that, watch this, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now I don't know if you fully understand what you've just heard, but from a tiny little room over a two-year period of time, not just everybody in Ephesus hears the word of the Lord, all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. Can I hear an amen? That means this, the possibility tonight exists that from this one church, if we get really serious with God, not just everybody in Beckley, West Virginia, not just everybody in the state of Virginia, but everybody in the United States could ultimately hear the word of the Lord Jesus if just we got serious. Have you ever thought about that? Now what I want to show you tonight, and I hope you'll jot this down, Paul is becoming known for something in a certain place. And what I mean by that is this, and here's the way I'm going to word it. Paul is known in the halls of learning for his intellect. You say, preacher, what does that mean? Something I hadn't told you, Brother Scott, about the school of Tyrannus. In addition to being a small room in a thriving metropolitan city, it was also a very noted and notable room. It was a place, the school of Tyrannus was, where all the traveling philosophers of Paul's day, they knew of the school of Tyrannus. And all the traveling philosophers, the expert mentally, the mental elite of Paul's day, they all knew of the school of Tyrannus and they basically had a standing invitation. Anytime they came through the ancient city of Ephesus, they had a standing invitation to come to the school of Tyrannus, this tiny little room, and stand up and espouse their particular philosophy of life. Well, Paul goes there not to espouse philosophy. He goes there to preach the word of the living God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. But he does it in a place where the most brilliant-minded men of his day go. So he becomes known in the halls of learning for his intellect. You say, preacher, what are you trying to say? Please hear me out. Any of you listen to Christian radio? By the way, I'm on Christian radio. and uh, <laughs> Brother, I've not been. I'm even on, I don't listen to a whole lot of radio, period, much less a lot of Christian radio, though I'm on a, a program every day of the week and I'm heard on 450 plus radio stations. But I was listening a, a few years ago to a Christian radio station, and I'm not making fun, I'm just illustrating. But the guy that was on there was one of these country North Carolina, we call them wind sucking preachers. How many of you know what a wind-sucking preacher is? Okay. A few of you have not been enlightened. Is it okay, preacher, if I enlighten? Is it okay if I do that? Okay, wind-sucking is this, and I'm not making fun. By the way, I enjoy it, to be honest with you. But they'll get going, and they'll preach like this. Well, bless God, I tell you what, God's coming back. And he puts a ha on the end of everything. Everybody know what I'm talking about now? We call that wind-sucking in North Carolina. I'm not making fun. Okay, I'm just illustrating. Well, this guy was one of those. And boy, he was preaching... And preacher, I'm not kidding, here's what he said. He said, well, bless God, I'm ignorant, and I just pray I get ignoranter. (laughs) It is okay to laugh at that point. I mean, it really is. Preacher, I wanted so bad. My wife says, honey, you're terrible. But I, I was so bad, I wanted to grab my cell phone and dial the number that he had given earlier. Bless God, I'm ignorant and I pray I get ignorant to her. I wanted to call him and say, your, your prayer's been answered, brother. Your prayer's been answered! <laughs> now, I didn't do that. But it's almost like if slaughtering the king's English makes you more spiritual. Can I tell you, it doesn't. Why are we no longer known in the halls of learning for our intellect? Preacher, why is it we're uncomfortable in a setting where there are highly intelligent, highly educated people? Why do we feel intimidated? Do we not know the gospel and how to share it with someone? Do we not know our Bible well enough in the halls of learning to feel comfortable explaining to people who Jesus is, that He is precisely who He claimed to be? He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Why aren't we comfortable? 
By the way, if you'll study the entire book of Acts, you'll find there's one of three words that are used to describe Paul's preaching. And by the way, all three of them are mentioned in Acts uh, Acts 19. Pastor, Paul's preaching is described by the Holy Spirit with these words. He reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Or he disputed, which does not mean he argued. That's not what that means. It just means he's standing up line upon line, precept upon precept, like an attorney in a courtroom. He is showing people, convincing them mightily that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is the Christ. He reasoned with people. He disputed with people. The third word is this. He persuaded them. And by the way, my dear brother, reason, disputed, persuaded, that is not primarily, not primarily emotional terminology. Now, please don't misunderstand. I think a lot of our preaching does not have enough fire and enough passion associated with it. But I do want you to understand, preaching is not primarily an emotional exercise. There is a mental component. We ought to be known in the halls of learning for our intellect. Are you with me? Why aren't we? Pastor, a few years ago I was standing in the pulpit like I'm about to do looking down about the same distance as the height of this platform to the front of a church auditorium and I was giving the invitation and six people, three women, three men, walked forward. I could tell the pastor who was standing down front welcoming that I could tell his dilemma immediately because he's looking over his congregation And I knew what he was doing because I'd seen it before. He's trying to figure out, do I have three men? Do I have three ladies that can take these men and take these ladies? Do I have enough people that can take these six that are coming forward and can take their Bible and from the Bible show them how they can know Jesus as their Savior? Evidently, he didn't have six he was confident in. So he took the three men. He motioned for his wife to come and she took the three ladies. And thank God all six of them professed faith in Christ. But I got to thinking, were there not other people that know how to share the gospel? You say, well, that's his fault. He should have trained his people better. I would concur, except he had only been there one year. Preacher, the teaching and the training up to his arrival evidently had not prepared that congregation to know how to share Jesus. Wow. Now I believe the opposite's true here. In fact, I've heard this week, in fact, I was talking tonight to some folks that said they already had 400 and some people come by on trick-or-treat night and they gave every one of them at least one piece of candy and a gospel track. Can I hear a hallelujah right there? That's good stuff. However, folks... We ought to in any circumstance be close enough to our Lord, know His Word well enough and feel comfortable, I don't care who it is, feel comfortable sharing Jesus Christ with someone. Are we known in the halls of learning for our intellect? I want you to look at Acts 19.23. Paul was known in the halls of learning for his intellect. He becomes known a second place. Now stay with me. This is very important. I'm headed somewhere tonight. I don't want you to miss this. Look at Acts 19.23. By the way, same city, Ephesus, same time period. The two years that he is preaching in the school of Tyrannus and all of Asia is hearing the word of the Lord. Something else happens. Now, this is incredibly important. Get your, get your airbag ready, your seatbelt securely fastened. I want you to watch verse 23 of Acts 19. The Bible says in the same time, The same time that he's preaching in the school of Tyrannus, the same time there arose, and I love the words the Holy Spirit uses here, there arose no small stir about that way, the way of Christianity. So if it's not a small stir, what is it then? It's the converse of that. It's the opposite of that. It's a big stir. Folks, do you understand when Paul went into a community and preached the Word of God, something got stirred up. Can I hear an amen? Boy, it's been a long time since we had something stirred up in a community when the word was preached so powerfully that the beer joints closed down and the houses of ill repute shut down. Boy, it's been a long time. Boy, not Paul. When he went in, something got stirred up because the Holy Spirit's using it. It wasn't a little stir, it was a big stir. Well, what was the nature of the stir? Look at verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana... 
brought, and here the phrase is again, no small gain under the craftsman. In other words, Demetrius and the silversmiths, they're not bringing in meager gain. They're raking in money hand over fist. Well, Brother Dave, what are they doing? Well, the Bible says Demetrius is a silversmith. If you know anything about the ancient city of Ephesus, you will know that it housed one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It housed a building that was 425 feet long. By the way, if that doesn't impress you, (laughs) if you look at a professional football field, a college football field, it is 300 feet long. You add another 125 feet onto that, and you've got the length of the building I'm describing to you. 425 feet long. It is 225 feet wide. It is almost as wide as a professional football field is long. There are 127 columns, Pastor Tim, that go around this building to support the roof that covers this 425 by 225 dimension building. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was called the Temple of Diana or the Temple of Artemis as she was called in secular history. If you came in the back door of the Temple of Diana, you would have been directed in those days down a center aisle. That center aisle would lead you to the front, 425 feet from back to front, to a massive 50 foot tall statue believed to have been carved out of a meteorite that fell from heaven a statue of Diana of the Ephesians and if you've ever thumbed through a religious or secular encyclopedia and seen a picture of Diana you'll understand why I cannot describe her any further in a mixed audience she was lewd vulgar I'm going to use the term pornographic. 50 foot tall image in the front of the temple of Diana. You say, preacher, that doesn't help me. Who were the silversmiths and who was this guy Demetrius? They make silver shrines. It means this. Demetrius and the silversmiths have an industry in ancient Ephesus making scaled down replica, about 18 inches tall, versions of that 50 foot statue in the front of the temple of Diana. They make scale models of it. They set them up on shelves in the marketplace and they make them available for the residents of Ephesus or the tourists that come through. Can I just say it this bluntly? Demetrius and the silversmiths are ancient pornographers. This is the pornography trade. And the Bible says they're not bringing in meager gain. They're raking in money hand over fist. By the way, last year, do you know the pornography trade in America was a 13 billion, yes with a B, 13 billion dollar a year industry. 13 billion. This is fresh on my mind and my heart because it was a topic of conversation on the radio today. So men, please hear me. I love you. But I'm going to say it because it needs to be said. Preacher, the statistics now are these. I shared them with you at lunch. 79% of men 18 to 30 in, not outside, in the church of Jesus Christ. 79% of the men 18 to 30 are addicted to pornography. We got a problem, don't we? It is no shame to admit, I'm struggling. The shame would be never to admit it and continue to be a slave to it the rest of your life. That does not have to happen. There is victory in Jesus Christ. And I ought to hear an amen. There's victory. But Demetrius and the silversmiths are making these pornographic images. Now I want you to watch. Paul shows up in town goes to a lecture hall and starts preaching and he does that over a two year period of time. Not only does everybody in Asia hear the word, something else happens. Now look if you would please at verse 25 of Acts 19. Now stay with me, this is so interesting. Verse 25 says, Whom he, and the he here is Demetrius, 
the head of the pornography industry in Ephesus, whom he called together with the workmen, please note this, with the workmen of like occupation. That means all the guys that make these pornographic statues, he calls all of them together. Here's the irony of that. Normally, these guys are all in competition trying to sell their version of this pornographic image. But now they've got a common enemy in the form of the Apostle Paul. So Demetrius calls all the pornographers together. And look what he says to the middle of verse 25. He called them in of like occupation and said, Sirs, gentlemen... Ye know that by this craft, and he must have held up one of the images, by making these things right here, we have our, would you say the next word out loud? We have our what? Wealth. Guys, we are making a killing off of getting people addicted to this stuff. Look at verse 26. Moreover, in addition, ye see and hear. Oh, I love that. You're not just hearing about it, you're seeing the impact of it. You see and hear that not alone at Ephesus. Man, it's not just here at Ephesus we got this problem. But look at the incredible influence. But almost throughout all Asia, this Paul, one guy, hath, and here's one of the words that describes his preaching, hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that, and boy do I love this next phrase, oh, he must have waxed eloquent, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Can I let you in on a little secret? Demetrius isn't one bit concerned about the temple of Diana. He's worried about his wallet. Can I hear an amen? Guys, we got a problem. Somebody's about to shut us down. And it's one guy. Paul. Is that awesome, brother, or what? I'm one person, brother Dave. What can one person do? A lot when you're yielded fully to the Lord. A lot. So Paul is not just known in the halls of learning for his intellect. He's known a second place. Boy, a place we really need to be known today. He's known in the house of prostitution. He said, Richard, why would you call it that? Stay with me. Known in the halls of learning for his intellect, he's known in the house of prostitution for his interference. Do you understand the temple of Diana, 425 feet long, 225 feet wide? Boy, you ought to go read and look at drawings, renderings of what it was believed it would have looked like. Preacher moving in and out of that massive building, working there every single day, were 1,000 temple priestesses. Those temple priestesses, according to ancient history, were there for no other reason other than to pander to the lusts of men and women from all over the ancient world who knew the reputation of that building in the ancient city of Ephesus and they would come to Ephesus on a vacation for one reason only, to be immoral with one, two, three, five, as many of the priestesses as they could afford. It was nothing but an ancient house of prostitution. And Paul becomes known for his interference. Paul was a threat to the kingdom of darkness. By the way, we ought to become known as a threat to the kingdom of darkness. By the way, my friend Tony Evans, remember him? <laughs> he said, he's got a book. Any of you read it? It's called Kingdom Man. A man who lives for the king. He's got a woman's version too, Kingdom Woman. Have you read it? It's, isn't it awesome? In the book Kingdom Man, he says, every morning when I get up, I hope the devil... I hope the devil says, oh no, he's up. <laughs> so I'm going to have trouble today. Hey, that's the way the devil ought to view us. He's awake. So I'm going to experience opposition today from that Christian brother. Can I hear an amen? amen? Wow. Let me be real personal, okay? In 1973... My dad went to another pastor in Hickory, North Carolina. In those days, Hickory would have been a town of about 40,000 people. By the way, we had 100 and... I think it was 172 or 173 Baptist churches in Catawba County. Which Catawba County is most of Hickory. 173. Many of them were split off of another one, you know. 
you got Charity Baptist Church here and they split and split names itself Unity Baptist. <laughs> Think of the irony of that. Anyway, 173 Baptist churches. And we all got together, two of those 173 Baptist churches, the two pastors, my dad and the other pastor, and the congregations from both ministries. And we met on a Tuesday night, which is when they met in those days, in Hickory City Council Chambers because my dad had heard that they were going to allow into the city of Hickory, Hickory's first adult entertainment establishment. In fact, the business had already gotten started technically. It was called Marigolds. It happened to be a massage parlor. It was located off Highway 40, Interstate 40, at what is now labeled Exit 125. It's the Lenore Ryan College exit uh, as you drive through Hickory. And my dad was exercised because he knew the reputation of establishments like that. He knew what this was going to turn into. And so he went, took us as our church family down to the Hickory City Council. Other church in town does the same thing. My dad spoke as eloquently as I've ever heard him speak about what that was going to mean to Hickory if they allowed, Hickory City Council allowed him to stay. The other pastor spoke, members of both congregations spoke. At the end of that meeting, Hickory City Council voted, 1973, to close Marigold's down. Amen is right. In fact, they closed them down and ran them out of town on a rail. By the way, does the Lord have a sense of humor? He does. Marigold set up on a hill there off exit 125. When they closed the establishment and ran the people out of town, they took the hill down, leveled it, and a few years later, preacher, they built a business there called Home Depot. I want you to think of the irony. An establishment that destroyed homes spiritually now houses a place that builds homes physically. Does God have a sense of humor or what? That was 1973. This is 2017, the end of it. It's been a few years since I did it, but the last time I did it, I drove through Hickory, and I say it to my own shame, say it to the shame of our church. I counted one, two, three, four, five, six what they call adult entertainment businesses. Six. Brother, you know how many Baptist churches there are in the Hickory phone book in Catawba County now? 300, last time I counted, 376. Now Hickory's about 100,000 people now. But see, you'd think more churches, more Christians, more influence, right? No. No, we have more churches, but got more of the other. I don't quote Shakespeare often in the pulpit, but I'm going to tonight. Shakespeare said this, Conscience, conscience doth make cowards of us all. What does that mean? Boy, that's Elizabethan English that means this. You can't be rabidly against something, passionately in opposition to it, if you're involved in it yourself. Conscience doth make cowards of us all. Now please hear me out. Our pastor did this not long ago. He said, if I went down to the local movie rental store, or if I could go to your house and check Netflix and scroll through your history of what you have rented. Wonder what I would find. Boy, it got very quiet in the church that day like it is right now. What if the history on your computer could be projected on that screen and that screen. And everything in the last 30 days that you and I have viewed could be portrayed. It got even quieter in our church. And my pastor with a broken heart said, Men, ladies, we're not going to be able to communicate and minister with conviction. And God's power 
if we're involved in the very same thing the world needs to be delivered from. Folks, you know as well as I do, and I love you, you know that. But the devil has robbed us of our power because we've gotten so cavalier and so casual about what ten years ago would have made us blush. Are you with me? Pardon me, preacher, I'm going to do it. hate to, but I'm going to do this. Pardon me just a second. Amen, Brother Dave! Say it! Hey, listen, if I have to amen myself, help me out, please. I don't want to do double duty, okay? (laughs) I love you. You know that. Are we known in the house of prostitution for our interference? Are we a threat to the kingdom of darkness? Now, folk, hear me. There's a price to pay. Pastor, I did something I never dreamed I'd get the kickback. I'm sure you saw it. Probably you folks saw it. It made not national news, it made international news. We posted a billboard on Interstate 40 a number of months back. And all it said was, why support the president's travel ban, which is a temporary restriction of people coming into the country? And by the way, the head of Home Depot tonight on the news before I left and came to church said it. Man, I was shouting in the room. I'm sure they're going to say, that guy you had staying over there, man, he's a loony tune. I'm sure they're going to probably say it. But no, I was listening to the CEO of Home Depot say, we have got to see that we make sure who we, that we know who's coming into our country. we got to have borders, defensible borders. That we don't. That's true. Did you know God's a God of borders? Read Acts 17. He established the boundaries of men's habitation, the borders of their habitation for this purpose, that they might seek the Lord. Every time there's been an attempt in the Bible, go all the way back to the Tower of Babel, to take down borders, it's always been done in defiance of God. You've got to have defensible borders or you don't have a country. Are you with me? You've got to. So we put a billboard that said, Why support the president's temporary travel ban? Because... 2,977 Americans were killed by 19 Muslim immigrants on 9-11, 2001. Did you know that's the truth? That's the truth. 2,977 people died because 19 people came into this country. Oh, you say, Brother Dave, they didn't get an immigration visa. No, nobody knew what their intent was. From what they said, they were planning on staying. But see, nobody knew. They had no intention of fully immigrating here. They're just going to be here a short time, long enough to perpetrate their horrific act. But as far as the authorities knew, they were immigrating here. Preacher, that sign had a four-second sight time. That is, as you're driving by at 65 miles an hour, which is what the speed limit is on that section of Interstate 40, and you see the sign, all legitimate time you have to see it, some total... Maximum of four seconds. That sign and that piece of real estate went global. And because my name was associated with it, because of our pastor's network, I'm not kidding, brother. Three days after the billboard went up, I started getting phone calls and my cell phone literally rang every ten seconds. People that didn't even know me were leaving messages. I hope you just die. How can you be a racist? Racist? Yes, you're speaking against the Muslim. Islam is not a race. Have we lost our minds in America? Are you with me? Driven by emotion and very inaccurate information, I had death threats on me and the crowning, the crowning threat was when encased in a piece of plastic, human feces arrived, sent to me with another threat. And yet, preacher, we're the bad guys, right? We're the intolerant ones, right? Right? Preacher, you're intolerant. Really? Really? Do we want to actually go there? Really? I don't hate anyone. I love the American people enough. I want to see my fellow citizens protected from what happened today in New York. Are you with me? Because I'll tell you something, brother. 
Probably those eight men that died today run over by a terrorist. Probably all eight of them didn't know Jesus. Which means they never get a second chance to hear the gospel. And I want them to hear it. Are, are you with me? There's a price to pay for being known in the house of prostitution for your interference. There's a price to pay for being a threat to the kingdom of darkness. But it's a worthwhile price. Because Jesus paid the ultimate price, didn't He? When He left heaven's glory and came to this sin-cursed earth and allowed Himself to be nailed to an old rugged cross by His own creation that He might die for your sin and for mine. There is no price too big to pay based on what Jesus did for me. Are you hearing me? Wow, I know you folk believe that. And I love you for it. Are we known in the halls of learning for our intellect? Are we known in the house of prostitution for our interference? There's a third place. I want you to look at Acts 19. It's mentioned second in the chapter, but I've saved it till last because it's by far and away the most intriguing. Look at Acts 19 verse 11. Acts 19 verse 11. I just want to mention it and we're going to be done. I want you to see this. Same city, Ephesus, same time period. The two years that Paul is preaching in that school of Tyrannus. Look at verse 11. It says, and God wrought... Notice it doesn't say just miracles. It says God wrought... What's the word there? God wrought... Special miracles. Pastor, we believe in what's called the verbal plenary inspiration of the Scriptures. Now those are big words. All it means is this. We believe that when God breathed out the Scriptures and holy men of God wrote it down, God didn't just, didn't just give them concepts. He gave them the very words He wanted them to write down. Amen? Can I hear an amen? Now He used their unique personalities and their unique writing styles and how all that worked, I don't know. But the very words, verbal plenary inspiration, the very words God wanted on the page is what we have. So when the Bible says God wrought not miracles, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, the word special is included for a reason. By the way, the word special means unique. God is working unique miracles by the hands of Paul. Well, what does that mean? Well, look at the nature of the unique miracles. Look at the rest of the verse, verse number 12. So that from his body, from Paul's body, were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, or aprons, that is, pieces of fabric, and the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. Now look up at me for a second. This is not fabric, it's part of a paper towel, but I got it tonight because I'm wanting to illustrate something. I didn't have a piece of fabric with me. From Paul's body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. You understand Paul in this thriving city of Ephesus, he's one person, he can't be everywhere at one time. So God is working some unique miracles. They're laying fabric on Paul's body. They're removing the fabric. Pardon me for using you, brother, okay, as my illustration. They were carrying the fabric to afflicted people, and the people were afflicted with either a disease or demon possession, and I'm not saying you have either, okay, all right? But they were laying fabric on these afflicted persons, and the mere laying of fabric on an afflicted person, diseased or demon possessed, fabric that had prior been on Paul, the act of Laying that on that person calls that person to be healed. Can I hear an amen? amen? Now the Bible calls that a special miracle. You say, Brother Dave, why do you keep underscoring that? Here's why. I was talking to a guy one time. We were talking about this. I said, you know, the Bible said that this was a special miracle for Paul. He looked at me and said, that's not special. I said, well, the Bible says it is. Why would you say it's not? He said, because I watch that kind of stuff all the time on Christian television. <laughs> I said, can we, brother, be known in the halls of learning for our intellect for a second? He said, what do you mean? I said, I want to ask you something. If these guys on Christian TV can do what they claim to do, you know, wave your hands and everybody like dominoes falls over, right? Or blows on people and it's more than bad breath creating the response and they fall over. Or stick their fingers in people's ears and supposedly extract demons. If they can do this, my question was, why do they rent an arena to do that? He said, what, what, what does that mean? I said, if they can, you know, rub a part of a person's body and, you know, extract or remove or heal a tumor, why do they rent an arena? Why don't they just go to every hospital? Third or fourth floor, cancer unit. Amen? And why don't they go down the hallway and go in that room there and that one there and that one down there? If they can do this, why don't they go to ground zero for disease, the cancer ward? And why don't they turn them all free of their problem if they can really do it? Amen? Amen. 
He said, oh, preacher, they're not going to do that. I said, why not? Oh, brother, you're just too blunt. Give me knuckles. I appreciate that. Amen. Man, you're speaking truth in love. See, yeah, they can't make any money off that. And at the hospital, they don't have their specially designed platform, you know, with their electric shock underneath it. And whenever they, you know, wave their hand, the people get electric shock, and they think, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. Oh, you say, Brother Dave, they don't do that. <laughs> Folk, I'm sorry. Sometimes you know just too much. They do do that. Now let me ask you a question. What if though, what if some of what we watch on Christian television and some of what happens in these big coliseums, preacher, what if it's not fake? What if these guys can do what it appears they can do? Oh, Brother Dave, you don't think? Yeah. What if they can do the miraculous but the power they're getting to do this stuff is not God's power. Oh, preacher, no! Why don't you look at your Bible? Look at Acts 19, verse 13. God is doing something unique through Paul. The minute that happens, counterfeits show up. Look at verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews... The word vagabond means itinerant, traveling... Brother Tim, they had their traveling medicine shows back then just like they got them today. Certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you. And the word adjure means we command. We command you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. You say, Brother Dave, what does that mean? Scott, come up and help me just a second, buddy, would you? Come up and help me just a second. Brother, I appreciate you doing this. Thank you. If I tag out and you take over from here, is that okay? okay. All right. See, now you're supposed to say no, no. But you'd be ready. I know you would, okay? You're my friend. Stand right here and face me. Okay, stand right here and face me. And uh, did I choose the right guy? You're going to be a demon-possessed man, okay? All right. He's ready. I got the right guy, didn't I? Okay. By the way, I love your sense of humor and I love your love for Jesus. So praise the Lord. Now, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to contort or anything. You just stand there and pretend you're demon-possessed and just look at me, okay? Now, the Bible, says, <laughs> the Bible says certain of the vagabond Jews, and he's going to be one of these traveling Jews, okay? I, actually, I'll be that. You're going to be the demon -possessed. Certain of the vagabond Jews, traveling Jews, exorcists, I'm one of those, took upon them to call over them, that's you, that had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus. So in other words, what we vagabond Jews are doing is calling the Lord's name over demon-possessed people. Everybody with me? And the Bible records the formula, the formula that we use. And the formula is, we adjure you, we command you by Jesus that Paul preaches. Now, let me modernize it, put it into modern terminology, and you just stand there, okay? No, you don't get to pass out. No, no, you don't get to do any of that. Bless your heart. Okay, anyway. I'm a vagabond Jew. I'm calling the Lord's name over him. He's demon-possessed. I'm really not talking to you. I'm talking to the demon inside of you. And what I say is, I command you. Come out. Come out, demon. Come out. In the name of Jesus, that, that guy Paul is preaching about. Because that's what the verse says. We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Right? Come out, demon. Come out. In the name of Jesus. That Paul is preaching. Now, let me ask you a question. Wait right there. What's wrong with that? Come out, demon, in the name of Jesus. That Paul's preaching. What's wrong with that? Should be fairly obvious. Yes. Yes. It's not the Jesus that they're preaching. It's the Jesus that Paul's preaching. You know why they appeal to the Jesus that Paul's preaching? Yes, sir. A plus. They don't know Jesus. Are you with me? Now, this is so important. It is dangerous to play around with the demonic, period. But it's doubly dangerous when you don't know Jesus. Are you with me? Come out in the name of Jesus that Paul is preaching. So for authority, they have to appeal to the Jesus that 
Paul is preaching because they don't know that Jesus. Now, would you mind sitting right here and just waiting because you're going to graduate in just a second, all right? Now, I want you to watch your Bible. These guys get something they didn't plan on. Look at verse 14 of Acts 19. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. In other words, there's a guy in town, chief priest, his name is Sceva. He's got seven sons, Scott. And these seven boys try this little incantation that you and I just illustrated. Look what happens. This is something they didn't plan on. Look at verse 15. And the evil spirit answered, Come out in the name of Jesus that Paul is preaching. The demon talked back to them. Look what he says, verse 15. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know. You mentioned Jesus? Come out in the name of I know Him. Look at the rest of it. And Paul I know. Come out in the name of Jesus that Paul is preaching. You mentioned Jesus, know Him. Mention Paul, know Him. Look at the rest of the verse though. I don't think I ever heard of you guys. (laughs) Who in the world might you be? And the next verse says, The man in whom the evil spirits are jumps on those seven sons of Sceva and sends them running out of the house naked and wounded. Are you with me? I know who Jesus is, know who Paul is. Never heard of you guys. Ah! And they take off running, right? Now this is very important. Again, I'm not trying to impress you tonight, but I do want you to learn something. This is Halloween, right? Fitting topic. Jesus I know. Paul I know. We only have one word for knowledge in English. It's spelled K-N-O-W. No. Do you know the Greek people had three words for knowledge? It's a very exact language. When the demon says, Jesus I know... The Greek word there translated know in English is one of the Greek words, one of the three. Paul I know, same English word because we only got one word for knowing in English. But the Greek word from which that word is translated is not the same word as over here. It's a different word, the second Greek word. Why two different words? Because the demon's communicating two different things. Like what, preacher? Jesus I know, that is a knowledge gained from experience. You say, preacher, what does that mean? It's an experiential knowledge. It literally means this. The demon is saying, you, you mentioned Jesus. Ooh, I know who he is by experience. There's an indication here, and many Bible scholars believe this. I think they're right about it, that the demon is saying, oh, I know who Jesus is because I had a run-in with him before. Maybe this demon was cast out of somebody else by Jesus at a prior time. Are you listening to me? Man, I'm, I've been on the receiving end of Jesus' power. You mentioned Jesus, come out and name Jesus. I know who He is because I had a, an experience with Him. Paul I know. Totally different word in the Greek. That knowledge, Paul I know, is not a knowledge gained by experience. It's a knowledge gained by proximity. You say, Brother Dave, help me understand that. Would you help me, Scott? Would you stand right here face the back? And see the dear lady sitting right there, you know, right there. That is your target. Okay, the aisle, not her. I want you just to walk, when I tell you to, at a regular clip. Okay. okay, and when you get there, turn around, come back here at a regular clip. Turn around and stand like you ride, right, are right now, okay? Now, okay. You're, you're no longer demon-possessed, by the way. You're Paul. You no, know, you don't get to run around or anything. You're Paul now, okay? We had to pretend you were demon-possessed. We had to pretend you're Paul, too. So anyway, here we are. You're the Apostle Paul. And for the sake of this illustration, I'm going to be the demon. Now, stay with me. Very important. No, no, no piggyback. Okay. All right. <laughs> Jesus, I know, that's a knowledge gained by experience. Paul, I know, that's a knowledge gained from proximity. What does that mean? Paul, start walking. It means the demon is saying, I know who Jesus is because I had a run-in with him. I know who Paul is because I've been in close proximity to him. Literally, a great synonym is this. I know who Paul is because I've followed him up close. I've looked for weaknesses in his character. I've looked for chinks in his armor. I know who Jesus is because I had a run-in with him. But I know who Paul is because I followed him in close proximity. And the assessment of the demon is this. From my following Paul in close proximity, watching him when he's around people and when he's not, the assessment I've come to is this. Not only is Jesus real, but Paul is too. But you seven sons of Sceva, (laughs) you're not real. Ah! And they take off running. Are you hearing me? So Paul is not just known in the halls of learning for his intellect. He's not just known in the house of prostitution for his interference. He's known in hell. For what, Dave? 
known in hell for his integrity. He's the real deal. And by the way, can we give our dear brother a round of applause? Thank you, brother. If you run for anything, I vote. I promise. Okay? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wow. Let me ask you a question. Are we known in hell for being the real deal? Now with this, I'm done. Please hear me out. I'm not trying to frighten anybody. Pastor, only one time in 33 years has this happened. It was with a group of teenagers. And I happened to be preaching on musical choices. There was a lot of stuff going on in the country at the time. I was speaking to a group of teenagers and I was brought up how the devil has a form of music that he's trying to capture the hearts of America's youth with. And preacher, I'm not kidding. A demon-possessed young lady screamed out in the service. A snarling voice, stop, stop. And we got a little taste that night of the side we don't see with our physical eye. Are you with me? Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not real. The demonic world is real. I want to ask you a question tonight. Because it's not just Paul that demons followed. Do you know they follow us? They do. You ever wonder why on Sunday morning it's so difficult to get to church? And why what your wife or husband says to you just irritates the fire out of you on Sunday morning and you walk in getting ready to worship God and you're already out of shape with your spouse. I'm just speaking honest because I've been there too. Right? Yeah. Because the wicked one has demons that try to stir the pot on Sunday morning. Or revival week while everything goes haywire. Car doesn't work right. You got more stuff to do. Man, I don't have time to go tonight. The devil doesn't want you here. Demon imps are working because they follow us. What if tonight, what if tonight the demonic world that we cannot see but is very real were to all of a sudden do something in this room? Preacher, what if the demons were to start talking about what they know from following me and you. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. Brother, I love you. You're my friend. But what if demons who follow you every day, they see you and they see me in our private world when nobody else is watching. What if they just started talking about what they know about us from watching us in our private world? What would they say, brother, if they talked about you or you, my dear brother? Or you, dear sisters? Would they say, you know what? I know Jesus is real. But so is he. And so is he. And so is he. And so are they. And Because I followed him. Or would they say this? I know what they appear to be. In public. But what they are in private is quite different. Because I followed them. You say, preacher, that scares me. Probably should. By the way, if it scares us for demons to know what we are, why are we not frightened that God knows what we are? I love that passage in Genesis where Hagar out under a little shrub bush, she just utters this statement, Thou, God, seest me. See, all the demons can do is watch our actions. God knows not only our actions, He knows the motivation behind it. Thou, God, seest me. Now with this I'm done. Are we known in hell for our integrity? Brother Scott, I was in a church in 1992. I'd been there one time before. It was a great place. 
had a wonderful meeting. I was back about a year and a half later. The church was totally different. It was cold. I mean, you could cut. You could cut the tension with a knife. That Sunday morning, I gave an invitation, sat down. There was nothing. Nothing happened. Pastor got up behind the pulpit and he said, Folk, I, I know God wants to do something. I don't feel like we should close the service yet. Is there anybody here that has anything they need to say? That's the way he worded it. Anything you need to say? Right where you're seated, my dear friend, was a guy, and I'm just going to say his name. He's in heaven now. You'll meet him one day. His name was Barton Stover. Barton Stover. What a wonderful guy. He stood up and said, Yes, preacher, I have something I'd like to say. And the pastor said, Yes, Barton, go ahead. Barton stepped out into the aisle and he looked back to the seats behind him. It was a pew. And there was a young man there and a girl. And I found out later the young man was his son or son-in-law. The girl was his daughter or daughter-in-law. I don't remember which. But they were a married couple. They were his kids. And he looked at him and he began to weep. And from weeping it went to wailing. And I don't mean, you know, sobbing. I mean, it sounded like this. I mean, I'd never heard that before. He was wailing in grief. And in the midst of the wailing, you could understand what he was saying. He said, we got problems. We got problems. He said, this is a small community. Everybody knows we got problems. I didn't know what he was talking about. Pastor told me later, Dave, what he's talking about is this. His son or son-in-law, daughter, daughter-in-law, They had separated and been separated six months. But you know what they'd do? They'd come to church like they were still together and everything was fine. They actually drove separate cars from separate locations, met at a common location and either came to the church in her car or his car. They came in one car and sat there like everything's fine, smiled. As soon as church was over, they went their separate ways and didn't see each other until Sunday morning. And the hypocrisy was driving Barton crazy. We got problems. And this is a small community. And you can't hide it. Everybody knows we got problems. And he literally said this. He said, I'm tired of pretending. And he said this morning, and he reached up like he was going to pull something off. And he made this gesture as he said, this morning I'm taking my mask off. And then he sat down. You could have heard a pin drop in there like you can in here. That young pastor said, Bless your heart, Barton, for your transparency. God loves transparency. Just being real. He said, Does anybody else have anything they'd like to say? Third row, right here. A visitor raised her hand. I'll never forget this as long as I live. She stood up and said, I'm a visitor my first time here. Pastor, I found out later they'd been inviting her for six years. She had never come till this Sunday when Barton stood up and took his mask off. She said, I'm a visitor, first time here. I'm just wondering. I'm not sure if this is the right time or not, but I'd like to get saved. I'd already given an invitation. She didn't want to get saved then. You know what she told the pastor's wife who led her to the Lord? I figured if that guy back there could get real, so could I. Not sure if it's the right time or not. It's always the right time to get saved though, isn't it? Not sure if it's the right time or not, but I'd like to get saved. Preacher, it was on from there. She was the first of 19 people that trusted Christ in that tiny little community of Obion, Tennessee, north of Memphis. And God breathed on us in revival power. Can I tell you why it happened? Because one man got real and right with God. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Folks, I love you. I do. Love you enough to ask you a couple of very direct questions. First question is this. 
Please be real. Please be transparent. Please be brutally honest. God knows the answer to this.